Hello, I'm Eric Corman, Communications Director at League of Education Voters and the parent of a seventh grader of color in the public school system who is accessing special education services. This webinar features closed captions. To access captioning, just click on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Spanish interpretation is also available. To access this webinar in Spanish, in your webinar controls at the bottom of your screen, click interpretation, which is the icon that looks like a globe, then click Spanish. And if you want to hear only Spanish without the original English in the background, click mute original audio. Special thanks to Claudia Azar, who is our interpreter. If you have any technical issues, feel free to use the chat function, which I will monitor throughout the webinar. In case you're not familiar with us, League of Education Voters is a statewide nonprofit working with families, educators, and leaders to build a brighter future for every Washington student. Our website is educationvoters.org. We believe that education is a tool for justice. One of the systems that perpetuate racial injustice experienced by communities of color in our schools is our system. We believe every child deserves an excellent public education that provides equitable opportunities for success. In order to achieve this, we must pursue radical change in our school systems for equity, justice, and liberation. We must build schools and systems that honor the humanity of every student. Welcome to our online webinar series, Lunchtime Webinars. We started this series eight years ago to share information and build knowledge on important and timely issues. Today's webinar is the 2022 Legislative Session Recap, What Washington Students Got. League of Education Voters Director of Policy and Research, Jacob Vela, and LEV Partners from the Washington State Legislative Youth Advisory Council, LIAC, the One America Youth Advisory Council, Open Doors for Multicultural Families, Graduate Tacoma, the Governor's Office of the Education Ombuds, ACLU Washington, Career Connect Washington, and the Tukwila School District Board will provide an overview of what happened in Olympia, status updates on our collective 2022 legislative platforms, and next steps to prepare for the 2023 legislative session. And now I would like to ask each panelist to introduce yourselves. I'd like to start with our students, um, Shreya and Israel and Mahad. So feel free to popcorn in and then other panelists feel free to jump in as well. I can start off. Um, hi, my name is Shreya. I am a junior at North Creek High School in Bothell, Washington, which is in the first district. And I am a first year member of LIAC serving on um, our legislative affairs committee, our bill writing committee, and then also our equity task force. Hi, um, I'm Israel Lopez um, on LIAC as well, serving the legislative affairs committee, bill writing committee, and Rural Task Force Committee. <clears throat> um, and I am a full-time Running Start student at Scott Valley College in the 39th Legislative District in Cedar Woolley, so kind of Bellingham area up north. All right, hello everybody. My name is Maha Tahir and the pronouns I identify with are he, him, and his. And I'm from the organization One America who recently and uh, helped pass a huge bill in the federal in address and uh, language access in schools all across the state and hopefully immigrants get these uh, ser education services such as uh, interpreter services in order to like in order for in order for their child to succeed in school parents need to know about how and how their child is doing in school and so with this bill like immigrant parents like and they can better understand like how their children are performing not only how they're performing in school but how they can how, how they can be involved in their children child's education, and I'll explain that in, uh, during this uh, session. Yeah, thank great. you. Yeah, thank you so much, students. I really appreciate you being here, and thanks for introducing yourselves. All right, so how about uh, the rest of the panel, uh, Emily? Why don't you go ahead? Thanks, Eric. I was just wondering if I should hop in. Um, for those of you who are uh, new faces, uh, who haven't met me before, my name is Emily Fung. I'm from Open Doors for Multicultural Families. 
uh, which is a community-based organization that supports um, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities who are also from multicultural backgrounds, and I am an advocacy coordinator there. And the rest of you are welcome to, to popcorn in as well. Um, I'll go ahead and go to Rose. Hi, thanks so much. I'm Rose Spidell. I work as a senior education ombuds at the Washington State Governor's Office of Education Ombuds, which is a bit of a mouthful, also known as OEO, and delighted to be here today. How about I pass it over to Dave? Thanks. My name is Dave Larson. I'm on the Technical School Board. I've been on for 14 years, and I'm also on the legislative committee of the Washington School Directors Association, uh, which is the association that um, represents school board members throughout the state. How about uh, Andy? Hi, everybody. I'm Andy Ferreira. I'm a principal at a consulting firm called Kinetic West. And we do social impact consulting firm uh, consulting work in Washington State and across the country. A lot of our work is focused on work-based learning and youth apprenticeship. And for the last three and a half years, we've been supporting Career Connect Washington. So I'm gonna be wearing my Career Connect Washington hat today as I talk to you all um, and some exciting developments in the legislature. Um, just real briefly, for those who aren't familiar with Career Connect Washington, we're a statewide initiative that works to provide youth up to age 30 with the skills and training that they need in order to uh, enter and succeed in high demand jobs uh, with a pathway towards a living wage. So excited to be talking about all of that. Um, and I'll turn it over to Kendrick. Good afternoon. My name is Kendrick Washington. I'm the um, Director of Policy Advocacy Group at the ACLU, he, him pronouns. Um, I'm here, I was previously in a capacity as Youth Policy Director for the ACLU. Um, and so I'm here in that capacity today. I'm really excited to be speaking with folks um, on the variety of the great topics we have here today. Uh, just a little bit about the work we do at the ACLU in the youth world. Um, we do a lot of work around the school to prison pipeline, um, criminal justice, um, some disability advocacy, and then of course, where all of those things intersect um, in our K through 12 schools. And I will pass it to, I'm trying to think, is it Ben? Thanks, Kendrick. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. My name is Ben Mitchell. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy at the Foundation for Tacoma Students. Um, Foundation for Tacoma Students is the backbone nonprofit for the Graduate Tacoma Movement uh, in Tacoma, obviously, as the, as the name implies. We're a cradle to career intermediary organization in the city, and we play a role of helping to align organizations, institutions, individuals, all of whom are considered community partners around positive outcomes for students. Um, so that's my day job. And then outside of that, I'm also on the board of League of Education Voters, and I'm excited to be a part of this panel. I'll pass it to Jacob. Thank you, Ben. Uh, I'm Jacob Bello. Um, I am the Policy and Research Director at, at LEV. Um, thank you for joining today. It's so wonderful to have you all here. I really appreciate you being part of this. To begin today's webinar, I would like to acknowledge that we are on the ancestral and unceded traditional lands of the 29 federally recognized and non-federally recognized tribes in Washington state, including the Chehalis, Chinook, Colville, Cowlitz, Ho, Jamestown, Sklalem, Kalispell, Lower Elwha, Clallam, Lummi, Makah, Muckleshoot, Nisqually, Nooksack, Port Gamble, Sklalem, Puyallup, Quileute, Quinault, Samish, Sauk Seattle, Shoalwater Bay, Skokomish, Snoqualmie, Spokane, Squaxin Island, Stiligwamish, Suquamish, Swinomish, Tulalip, Upper Skagit, and Yakima. We give thanks to elders both past and present, our native and indigenous colleagues, and the land itself. A couple of housekeeping items before we begin. You'll notice a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. This is a space for you to submit questions to us. If time permits, we'll have about 10 minutes for questions after the panel discussion wraps up. As always, feel free to send any feedback about the webinar quality to us on the chat function or at info at educationvoters.org. And speaking of the chat function, you're welcome to use it to check in and comment on anything you hear. Welcome Shreya, Israel, Mahad, Emily, Ben, Rose, Kendrick, Andy, Dave, and Jacob. 
We'll have about five minutes for each organization to share their takeaways from the session and next steps to prepare for 2023. And panelists, you're welcome to ask any questions or provide comments on anything you hear. And of course, feel free to use the chat function as well. I'd like to start with LIAC. So uh, Shreya and Israel, the floor will be yours. And then uh, Mahad, feel free to uh, jump in after them. And then each organization represented will have about five minutes and we'll end with Jacob at League of Education Voters. So Shreya and Israel, it's all yours. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having us. So I wanna start off with a very big news. LIAC wrote a bill in collaboration with Federal Way ASB, which was signed into session law, House Bill 1834, which would create a new category for excused mental health days. So it would categorize excused absences as mental health. And with this bill, it created a student advisory group, which would evaluate the data collected by that and better allocate and see where students may need some extra support in regards to mental health. Um, that's a very big bill. We are very proud of it. Um, and I want to pass it on to Shreya for the next bill. So in addition to the bill that we wrote and successfully passed, um, LIAC also lobbied for a lot of student related bills this session. And so now we're gonna be sharing a bit about those. And we count these as really big wins for students just because these were things that we had a lot of people on our team go through all the different bills that were being written and introduced to legislature this year. And these were a couple that we specifically focused on to um, make sure that are being they were being heard by legislators. So the first one we wanna talk about is Senate Bill 5546, which is an insulin affordability bill. And this bill essentially lowers the price of insulin from being um, a limit of $100 a month to $35 a month, which is an insane price reduction for um, a lot of families of youth. And I know personally, um, when I was talking about this and posting it on my Instagram story, I had a friend slide up and share his story about how his grandmother um, has diabetes and how this bill really impacts their family's financial situation because it makes it a lot easier for them to just be able to access insulin without going through a lot of hoops or having to have a certain kind of insurance for uh, insulin. And so this is representative of a bigger goal that LIAC has, which is really about health equity for um, uh, youth, because when specifically like insulin is just an amazing case, how even though um, I, it might not be the youth that has diabetes, it might be the youth that has diabetes, but it might not be that specific, like it doesn't matter who has diabetes in the family, it affects the financial situation of the entire family. And so that kind of bill that addresses health equity in such a substantial way is something that LIAC was very happy to see passed. And we also want to continue that in the 2023 session, just making sure that healthcare becomes more equitable for youth and their families. All right, Shreya and Israel, thank you very much. All right, um, people. Sorry, are you finished? We had uh, two more quick things to share. All right, sorry about that. Um, and then to continue on the um, mental health track, um, House Bill 1800, which we lobbied for, has been delivered to the governor yet to be signed. This bill would require the healthcare authority to designate at least one full-time employee to connect minors with behavioral health services. Um, this kind of builds on to LIAC's focus on equity in youth mental health and making sure it's accessible to every youth in Washington State. It's building on that and that's something we also want to carry on to the next session as well. And then I'll let Shreya speak on the very last and final bill. Um, in addition to equity, LIAC is also um, in partnership with the Washington Office of Equity, and we are very proud of the work that we're doing with them just to have youth advise more about what should be done in their five-year plan. And speaking more about empowering youth, that's um, the topic of the last bill that we wanted to cover, um, which is Senate Bill 5497, which allows for student representatives on the State Board of Education to vote. And when we heard about this one, we were very excited, um, just very excited to lobby for it, support it. I personally testified for this bill. And so um, this bill, it just, um, we have LIAC as a vessel for 
not only for us to connect with legislature, but also to engage youth to connect with legislature. And having this new change that student board representatives can now vote, it just indicates to students all across Washington that there's now a mutual trust relationship forming between the State Board of Education and the students that they're serving since they're now trusting students to vote on decisions that really impact them. And this kind of change, not only will it create changes in the types of decisions that the State Board makes, but it also encourages youth all across Washington to just get involved in their legislature, which is something that LIAC is also hoping to continue in 2023. And so those are all the bills that we wanted to cover. And Israel and I wanted to thank you guys for listening and inviting us here. We love webinars. Every time we get a little notification in the chat, there's a new one available. We always have people that are eager to present. And thank you all for the work that you do for youth in Washington. Yeah, you are most welcome. I'm Mahad, go for it. Uh, I just want to apologize to Shreya and Israel for interrupting them. I thought, I thought they were finished or something. <laughs> uh, but I really appreciate you guys sharing what you guys needed to share. It's so critically important. So I'm going to talk about and uh, what um, One America did. And before I do that, I just wanted to mention that One America is one of the largest immigrant advocacy groups in the state of Washington. And uh, we've been working on a multi multiple bills in uh, this session. But I'm going to talk about the one that I, that I worked on and I got passed, House Bill 1153 introducing language access in public schools in the state of Washington. The reason why this bill is important to me and people like me is because for two reasons. Number one, I was diagnosed with autism at an early age, which leads to my second reason. I'm the son of a refugee from Somalia, where unfortunately many people over there believe, believe that disabilities only exist in Western countries. And so hopefully with this bill, and then we can, I can not only educate many immigrant communities about like you know, disabilities in, in schools, but how to like help their children navigate through it by providing resources such as interpreter services for immigrants who do not speak English and, uh, and translated documents, IEP documents, which is extremely critical for the, for the parents to understand their child's uh, disability. And hopefully, and uh, this gets signed into law, which I believe it will. And uh, I just want to thank and uh, Katie Dong, who couldn't be here today, for and uh, allowing me to come on her team and uh, to promote and like and get this bill passed. And so, uh, and with that being said, I'll pass it on to someone, and uh, I'll pass it off to, to whoever wants to go next. Thank you, y'all. Thanks so much, Mahad. And, and actually, Emily, I think uh, I, I think that would make sense since you worked so hard on 1153. I really appreciate everything that that Open Doors and Partners did. Yeah, thanks for that, Eric. And um, thanks for the great prelude, Mahad. It's always so hard to follow you, but I will do my best. Um, you know what? Yeah, thanks, Mahad. <laughs> So um, yeah, Open Doors worked really hard on 1153 as well. Um, I think we were really fortunate to work with a lot of community members like Mahad and others, um, and also our parents from Open Doors for Multicultural Families. Um, we had so much wide and diverse community support for this bill to increase language access in public schools. And I, we really feel that that's what made the difference this year. Um, so part, I just partly wanna give an update about what's going on with the bill. Uh, it did pass through the House and the Senate and all the um, amendments that were made were also ratified and it was delivered to Governor Inslee. We are just waiting for the word to go to Olympia and uh, make sure he signs it into law, but uh, we are um, feeling really celebratory about that and know that this is just kind of, we're just waiting for the period on the end of the sentence there. And uh, throughout the journey of HB 1153 in the legislature this year, um, we're really happy that it enjoyed bipartisan and bicameral support. Um, so both across the aisle and in both the House and the Senate. And a lot of this is owed to the efforts of our um, prime sponsor for the bill, Tina Orwall. Uh, she just gave dogged efforts day and night to make sure that this bill was um, being read by folks, being heard by folks, and um, that the right people had eyes on it. Uh, so we really owe a lot of that to uh, everything that she did this uh, season. Um, this, many of you may know, our bill um, had a version last year that died in House Appropriations Committee. And um, 
we uh, were feeling kind of not sure what to do when this legislative session was coming up, but um, Tina Orwell really doubled down on her efforts to make sure that the bill was promoted and um, that it was in a good shape for the 2021-2022 legislative season. So we just thank her for that a lot. Um, and then we were also really lucky to have um, Senate champions as well. So people like um, Senator Wilson and Senator Trudeau were really big champions of our bill. Um, and then also we were really pleased to see a lot of um, legislators of color and both the House and the Senate support this bill. So um, I think it's been a, it's been kind of a turning point for us to see that people do care about um, immigrant issues and it's not just an immigrant problem, it's kind of an everybody problem. So that's been really awesome to see that. Um, and also speaking of, you know, this wide community support that this bill has got, part of what we're so proud about is um, that this bill allows for a community advisory board after the fact. So this bill originated in community and it's also going to be overseen by community. And um, part of what's excellent about the way that we've, uh, the bill has designed their community advisory board is that stipends will be available for people with lived experience. So we are really excited to see um, the expansion of kind of uh, financial value of people from the community giving their input on things uh, for the leg for, you know, lawmaking processes. Um, so once again, that's we're just super happy that everything, all the aspects of the bill are centering the voices of those that are impacted by the bill, uh, which is not something that you see uh, in a lot of laws that have um, passed in the past. Um, so yeah, that's basically the update. Um, other than that, we are really, we want to give thanks to um, our partners at the Interpreters Union and all of the other coalition members that we've seen come through, including Lev. Lev did an awesome job um, promoting 1153 throughout the legislative season. And we would be remiss if we didn't just say thank you to everybody from all corners of Washington State who have supported this bill. Thank you so much, Emily. I really appreciate it. Kendrick, would you mind going next to talk about ACLU Washington? Sure. I'm not actually going to I'm not actually going to take up a lot of time. Um, we didn't have as heavy a, a youth agenda this year as we did. And unfortunately, some of the bills that we were really pushing um, died this session. But sort of going back to a, a point, I believe, that Emily made um, when she mentioned that 1153 wasn't successful the previous year um, is that you just keep coming back. Right. Um, I think that the we're we've been finding stronger youth champions. Um, in the both the House and the Senate, from Tina Orwall to Rep, Rep Frame to Senator Wilson, um, et cetera, um, true, um, Jasmine Trudeau, who replaced another former champion. Um, oh, why did her name just fall out of my head? Senator Darnell. Um, and so the ACLU, um, while not at the forefront of any of these <laughs> bills for sure, um, did sign in pro on on quite a few of them, including um, HB 1153 and HB 1834. And the thing that really stands out the most this session, like if I had one takeaway, is that our elected officials are finally really coming around to recognizing the need to have community voices centered at, at the heart of all of these things. And, you know, you noticed it when, um, for HB 1834, when they, when they created the student advisory group, right? And the same thing for 1153, when they created the community advisory board. Um, the elected officials are, are finally coming around to this. And I think it's important that we continue to push. Um, it's, it's really easy for um, our elected officials or even people like the folks at the ACLU to sort of sit up in their academic policy ivory towers and, and come up with solutions. And none of those solutions really mean a thing if it's not in response to community needs and community voices aren't being heard um, and centered. So that's it. That's my big takeaway from this session. Great. Thank you so much, Kendrick. Is there anything you want to share regarding prep for 2023? Because you mentioned that that we have to keep coming back. And I know you had some really impactful bills that you were trying to get through this session that, as you said, didn't make it. But is there anything we can do to help or support uh, work for 2023? I mean, it's 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 tough to say, right? You know, because sometimes these things just die in committee because they've run out of time. Sometimes a bill that actually has a lot of support, like this session, and we won't say any names, dies because certain of, certain officials are running for um, re-election and they're running scared. 
you know, and they're, they don't want to, they don't want to take on anything controversial in a short session during an election year, you know, and, you know, I always say to them, running isn't going to get you away from the problem. And <laughs> if you're already on the brink, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't likely to save you, <laughs> but um, I digress. I think that really with these things, it continues to be about um, public and community education, really figuring out new and different ways to get community members um, involved, get the impacted individuals um, educated on the topic, because there's a lot of people they don't even realize that they could be in the fight with you for this thing that matters to them. So continuing to educate, and, and it's the process, right? Sometimes a bill fails the first two, three, four times. And when you look at what changed about the bill itself from beginning to end, it's, it's very rarely anything substantive, right? It's just the process of continuing to educate legislators and continuing to educate um, members of their, their, their constituents to, to continue to put pressure on them. So it's just a horrible thing to say but it's just sort of like you just got to continue to try to find that patience which is not an easy thing to do because oftentimes you know your civil liberties and your livelihood <laughs> are at stake while you're waiting for you know people who don't live the life you live to to come around and understand what it is you're trying to do yeah that makes perfect sense yeah thank you so much kendrick uh, ben how about uh, graduate tacoma thanks eric <clears throat> so Zooming out just, just for a second, Ed, so at Graduate Tacoma, we have a community-built goal, uh, and our goal is that by 2030, 70% of Tacoma Public School students will earn a degree, technical certificate, or gain a good earning wage employment opportunity within six years of high school graduation. Um, and we target our efforts on students of color and those who have been impacted by poverty. Um, and so thinking about kind of our, our state's sort of post-secondary landscape, even before the pandemic, it's, it was the case, it is the case that too few of Washington's young people, uh, particularly young people of color and those from low-income backgrounds, were enrolling in post-secondary education and completing uh, credentials. Um, we have seen declining post-secondary enrollments uh, in programs that provide post-high school credentials. Uh, and we have seen slippage, you know, kind of putting us moving in the wrong direction uh, when it comes towards making progress towards that goal of, of 70%. <clears throat> so for this legislative session, being as, uh, as fast as it was and with so much legislation moving, even though we do put out uh, an advocacy agenda that covers the full cradle to career continuum, we really focused and prioritized our efforts on expanding equitable access to post-secondary pathways. Um, going into the session, we knew there would be some good opportunities here. Um, and this legislative session, I'm happy to say, it did result in some uh, meaningful points of progress. Uh, there were several new policies and investments that will support uh, students' aspirations and needs as they work to complete a credential after high school. I'll touch on a few of these. Um, one uh, particular bill uh, will expand eligibility for the Washington College Grant Program. This was a bill that was sponsored by Representative Slatter. Uh, the bill increased the income eligibility threshold for the full Washington College Grant, so we'll see more students be eligible for uh, that, that uh, grant opportunity, which really is um, a first-class program compared to uh, peer states across the country. That same bill also created a new uh, program for bridge grants. And these uh, are an additional uh, grant opportunity for students who receive the full Washington College grant. They'll be eligible to receive an additional $500 each year uh, that can be used for non-tuition expenses associated with um, being in a post-secondary education program. So things like books uh, was an example that came up a lot. <clears throat> Um, there is also new money directed towards programs to promote the Washington College Grant. The Washington College Grant right now is undersubscribed, uh, and so uh, funds were directed towards programs to promote the College Grant. This was a bill that was sponsored by Representative Hansen. Uh, that same bill will also put funds into promoting uh, FAFSA and WAFSA uh, completion and helping uh, promote that to high school students so that uh, we, we hopefully see higher rates of completion for FAFSA and WAFSA. And then there's also a bill that created a new state student loan program. 
Uh, this was a bill that was sponsored by Representative Sullivan. The state student loan program, uh, will, or this will create a new student loan program that will issue loans with just a 1% interest rate, so very low interest rate compared to the typical landscape of student loans. And it was capitalized with funding uh, and on kind of like for a pilot basis. And so we'll uh, stand up this program in our state and see how it goes. Um, and hopefully it, it makes a meaningful difference. <clears throat> And then the last item I wanted to touch on, and the one that we at Foundation for Tacoma Students really focused our efforts on, and where I, I think we did uh, have an impact uh, in, in the passage of this bill, is a piece of legislation that creates a program called the Career and College Pathways Innovation Challenge Program. So this is a new funding stream that will be administered by the Washington Student Achievement Council. Uh, and this will fund um, local partnerships that are uh, based in communities that represent uh, coordinated efforts between uh, K-12 school districts, between post-secondary institutions, between community-based organizations, uh, and between employers to help students get uh, individualized outreach and uh, case management style support to help them navigate what is a complicated web of uh, applications and funding streams and decisions and things that uh, are hard to kind of uh, uh, pick your way through um, for, for many students. And um, so we think investing in coalitions like these is an acknowledgement that Generous scholarships and financial aid are absolutely necessary when it comes to increasing our post-secondary enrollment rates, but they're not sufficient by themselves. And we've seen in Tacoma that a piece that is often missing and that can make a difference when you resource it is a coordinated web of community supports uh, where we're fostering innovations on the ground that are specific and responsive to the particular situation uh, in a place. Uh, that center equity by engaging directly with community leaders. Um, and we think the Innovation and Challenge Program uh, will make some uh, important investments in communities across the state and, and help uh, students navigate post-secondary pathways. Uh, this bill was sponsored by Senator Emily Randall. It was co-sponsored by uh, a, our local senator here in the Tacoma region, uh, Senator Tawana Nobles. Uh, we have great appreciation for the two of them and all the others uh, that helped this bill get passed and funded in the session. Um, we're really excited about that. Great. Well, thanks so much, Ben. I appreciate that. And uh, Andy, uh, Career Connect Washington has some exciting post-secondary legislation that you'd like to share too, right? Yeah. Thank you, Eric. And uh, Ben, it's a great segue into talking about Kirk Neck Washington, because a lot of the work that we try to do as a large um, and fairly disaggregated system is to help connect a lot of those different parts that students and um, employers have to really navigate in order to prepare students for those high demand jobs. It's very difficult. It's a very big patchwork system that we have right now. And so that's where we try to focus is where do we see those gaps and where are there opportunities um, to, to really push progress forward um, to help students uh, earn those post-secondary credentials that are high value and gain um, valuable work-based training that's paid along the way to do it. And so um, similar to Ben's goal of 70% of students in the Tacoma area receiving a high value post-secondary credential, Career Connect Washington has a very similar goal of 60% of students in the state of Washington by the age of 29 will have enrolled in and will complete a career launch program, which combines uh, um, aligned classroom instruction that has uh, post-secondary credit attached to it, paid work-based training, and by the end, the participants should be able to compete for these high demand jobs should be ready just based on that credential alone. And that could be a part of an associate's degree, could be a part of a bachelor's degree, could be a registered apprenticeship program or anything that provides at least one year of post-secondary credit. So that way students really have something that's transferable and that they can show to employers. So we work with all sorts of different stakeholders throughout the state, uh, employers, labor organizations, community-based organizations, other nonprofits that sit more at the system level, state agencies, philanthropy, legislators, industry associations. I mean, it's, it's a pretty big list of those that we work with. Um, and uh, going into this legislative session, we were really focused on a couple gaps that we saw um, that we felt would, would be fitting for a uh, 
well, at least what we anticipated going in for a smaller supplemental session. And so um, we had uh, two wins that um, we're, we're pretty happy about, um, both in the operating budget. So there wasn't any policy change that uh, we pursued this year, though I'm just so excited to hear about all the bills uh, today. And I'm particularly struck by the State Board of Education, um, one that Shreya shared. I just think that's fantastic uh, to have voting students on uh, the State Board, um, along with uh, paid lived experience stipends. Sorry, I won't gush about the other bills, but just wanna call those out. Those are really exciting. Uh, but we have two things to celebrate from the operating budget. And the first is $3 million in ongoing funding each year um, for sector intermediaries. So that's like a just crazy jargon term. But what that means is helping connect the dots in uh, high demand industries. How do we create aligned pathways that really set up students and youth to learn about what is manufacturing? How do I develop some skills in manufacturing? Okay, how do I do a paid internship that matches the... Uh, the classwork that I'm doing in high school or in dual credit and running start or in a post-secondary institution. How do we connect those dots? And how do we find the programs that already exist in the state that are really good? And how do we bring them elsewhere? So it's um, a competitive grant pool of funding that allows uh, those organizations who have really good connections with employers to help them connect those dots so we can get their involvement in these pathways. So we can really bridge that gap between education and employment. So that way students can be prepared for uh, what they want in the future and uh, can be on that pathway towards living wage, family sustaining wage. So 3 million is a really big uh, win for us and then uh, and, and for the state, I would say. And then the other one is um, 1 million for enrollment funding to support career launch programs. So I mentioned those career launch programs, right? They have those four parts that I uh, talked about. And uh, currently we have funding in K-12 and the community and technical colleges to support enrollment for what are called endorsed career launch programs or approved career launch programs, but we didn't have it within the four-year institutions. And so this closed uh, discrepancy between the different post-secondary institutions to allow for $1 million to support enrollment. So that provides a greater incentive for four-year institutions to create these career launch programs, to look at the bachelor's programs that they have and say, hey, how do we add paid internship to that? How do we make sure that students that are in these programs can get paid so that they really have that great resume to walk right in the door once they graduate? So those are, those are our two um, big exciting moments. And as we move into 2023, looking at the biennial session, um, we're doing a, a pretty big look um, at what's it gonna take for us to reach that 60% goal statewide? It's a lot of students if you think about it, right? It's about, a, uh, based on projections, it's around 90,000 or so, or maybe 85,000 or so students for the high school class of 2030. So we're talking like 56,000 plus that need to receive these career launch credentials. That's a big number and that's every year. And so that's what we're really focused on is what are the big interventions that we need in order to increase enrollment and kind of move to like a bit of an exponential growth. So that's our focus. We're gonna be talking to a lot of our stakeholders with whom we've been talking to for a while, cultivating new relationships, um, really looking for feedback on what we can be doing better and how different partners in the system can also help us get there. So more to come and uh, anticipating an exciting uh, 2023 legislative session for CCW. Great. Thank you so much, Andy. And, and we did have a question come up. Um, and Ben, you might know the answer to this too. But yeah, Ben, you talked about the 70% goal for credential attainment in Tacoma. Andy, you talked about a statewide goal of 60%. What is the current rate of post-secondary credential attainment right now? I can feel that one. It's just over 40% projected, uh, about 42, 43, though I think my numbers could be slightly outdated with COVID because I know numbers have dropped a bit, as I believe Ben mentioned, um, but just above 40%. And we know that over 70% of jobs require a post-secondary credential. So we, we've got a big delta or a big gap to make up for. And, and that requires the system to really focus on what do students need? instead of what, is, what do the system actors need in order to move things forward. Great, yeah, thank you so much for just establishing that baseline. All right, I'd like to go to uh, Rose with the Governor's Office of the Education Ombuds, then uh, Dave, and then Jacob from Lev. Thanks so much, Eric. And um, I am delighted and um, just starting with a lot of gratitude for the work that folks have done to move things forward this legislative session. 
the OEO, Office of Education Ombuds, is a small state agency, and we get the opportunity to do some policy work on work groups. We get the opportunity to do some public education workshops, trainings, and a lot of our work is working um, directly with families and community members and educators trying to do informal collaborative problem solving when um, things get in the way for an individual student. All of that work um, we've been doing, we are a team of eight. And one of the big exciting things I'm happy to report is that just because of support from others, we are gonna be able to grow. So part of what I wanna share is from the budget, which our budget is gonna be able to go up a bit. We should be able to bring on a couple new team members and that'll help us do more of that work on systems thinking and also on the individual support. Um, we're going to need those team members because the other um, thing that we were really excited about, and again, just so full of gratitude for people who spoke in favor of it, is a bill, um, Senate Bill 5376, which um, will help us promote out information about OEO. So OEO has been in existence since 2006, so it's a while, um, but every year we're always challenged to get information out to the community that that we exist and that we're here as a resource, free, confidential, statewide. Um, the awareness bill will have, so districts can put information about OEO. They must put districts about information about OEO either on their website or like in handbooks that you, or packets that you give out at the beginning of the year or both. And so we'll be developing a little short blurb that describes OEO that districts can put up on their, on their websites. And you know, I really hope that will help just information about our office travel even further than it has. Um, a lot of times when I'm working with people, one of the things they say is, gosh, I wish I'd known about you earlier. So really appreciate that. And it, those things wouldn't have happened if we hadn't had great community support for, and from organizations and folks. And um, just really on the language access bill, so grateful for the work. Um, that has been a long, long time project and glad to see it move forward. And people have mentioned before this move towards the legislature recognizing and valuing the time of people on these state policy work groups that have lived experience and providing the stipends. And indeed, a lot of the bills and legislative or budget provisos specifically called out that some of the members of these new work groups or advisory committees can receive those stipends. And then there was a bigger bill is Senate Bill 5793 that sort of generally opened the door to that. It also gives a good solid chunk of work to our new state office of equity to kind of be thinking about how we're going to frame, how we're going to make that happen and how we'll, we're going to be able to review how it has influenced or how it's worked within our state policy work. So that I think is, is a fundamental shift to bring new voices into policy work. And I think this session, there has been a lot of that uh, delegating work out that we will see over the coming year. So one of the other things, um, this came in the budget and um, it creates a work group to look at um, trauma-informed and uh, uh, approaches to support students in distress that prioritize relational safety. And it really is aimed at bringing directly in voices of students and people who have experienced restraint or isolation in our public schools and really working hard and outlining alternative um, ways that schools can support students without getting to that point where they're looking at using restraint or isolation. And so that work group will be underway. It also has a provision for stipends for people with lived experience. And so I hope anybody listening today, if you think you might have a little bandwidth for work on policy stuff this coming year, there's just a lot of these opportunities that we need community voices. We need people with direct experience to, to speak um, on those. And then they'll be giving out a report. I. We, um, we get to sit on a number of already existing work groups. And so in that, there's been some smaller pieces moving forward. The, there's an institutional education work group that's looking at how to improve educational services for students who are in institutions. And they, um, they pushed forward a, a bill to make computer science electives available. Um, 
we've been working on thinking about how our system can do better by kids in foster care and kids who are highly mobile. And there was a bill that will help keep some of the school continuity pieces in place for kids when they're on a trial return home. Um, there was some big stuff around, um, I think, I don't know if someone else is going to speak to it, but the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Work Group um, has also gotten a, a charge to go forward and do some strategic planning. So again, there's just going to be a lot of work continuing over this coming year to figure out how we help our system, how we fix our systems to best serve students. Um, so excited to see that happening. I think next year, we may see more uh, policy proposals and stuff coming out from this work that will be happening coming up. So thank you. And thank you. Yeah, really appreciate the work that, that OEO is doing and especially the community involvement. I'm, I'm very excited about that. Dave, uh, what do you see from your perspective as a school board member at Tocqueville Public Schools? So the area that I've been kind of looking at for a number of years uh, to take the, the equity and apply it to the overall funding system that the state uses to fund uh, public schools and kind of the, the definite lack of equity. Uh, sometimes people call it progressive funding. You know, for me, it's basically funding based on student needs. So in other words, pushing more resources to the areas and schools that have maybe higher poverty rates or higher areas of students experiencing homelessness, whatever it may be. And it's interesting to look at a couple of uh, data points on that. The Education Law Center uh, back in Rutgers University every year uh, publishes a, a national report about is school funding fair and they rate each um, state based on their funding system and how they allocate uh, dollars to public schools. And, and this year, um, Washington State came out with a D minus in that rating in terms of equity and funding. In other words, you know, they're not, we're not pushing more dollars to the higher poverty schools. We're, you know, doing the reverse of that. So we have a regressive funding system. And when you do that, you know, we're trying to be closing these opportunity and achievement gaps, uh, whether it's income, race, um, whatever. And it's really hard to do that when you're when you have a funding system that's not pushing dollars where the highest needs are. And so you know, we need to be changing that and channeling resources to, to where the needs are. And it's interesting just looking at the legislature, um, there's been a couple of bills over the years that have uh, tried to get the legislator actually do an equity analysis. So when they're producing bills that have funding to some, you know, let's look at, you know, what is the impact, the equity impact of those? And those bills have never passed. There was another one last year that didn't pass. And so it's hard to get the legislators uh, kind of attention if they aren't, if the analysis is not being done about the impact of, of what they're doing. So I wanted to focus a little bit on, on this particular year, uh, House Bill 1664, which is focusing on one aspect of the funding system, and that is the support for um, support staff, uh, counselors, social workers, nurses, psychologists. And just to talk a little brief history of that and how the legislature has dealt with those uh, support uh, staff, which have, of course, with you know um, the pandemic have become even more critical uh, as students are trying to recover from all of that. Um, going back to 2009, they set up this system called the prototypical school model, which basically set out, you know, a typical elementary, middle and high school with certain uh, enrollment numbers and then allocated some, um, you know, FTE, full-time equivalent staff to each of those schools. And, and then, you know, how that gets allocated out to, to the actual schools, scale up and scale down, depending on, on what the individual schools and enro actual enrollment is. But one of the things that they did uh, or didn't do when they established those numbers was they didn't actually say, so what do students really need in these areas of counselors, social workers, nurses, psychologists to, to help them be successful? I mean, they didn't do that study. They basically just allocated some numbers. It had to be budget neutral, so there wasn't more dollars going to schools. And, and they didn't really determine whether that adequate, uh, the funding was adequate. Um, or, or ample, which is, of course, what our Constitution says it's supposed to be. And so we ended up with um, this thing that we've been stuck with for the last 13 years, prototypical school model, where 
for example, there's one social worker allocated for every 72,000 students in middle school, which is essentially zero. So essentially what we've been living with is this model where there's essentially zero uh, allocation for nurses, social workers, and psychologists, for example. And in addition to that, uh, not being ample or you know, even close to adequate, uh, there was no equity component. So the idea was that you know, in this current model, a school with 5% poverty is going to get the same number of social workers as a school with 90% poverty. Well, that doesn't make any sense. It's not equitable. It's not going to close any gaps. So anyway, that's a system that was set up in 2009. Um, the idea was that, that, you know, we're going to increase the funding there over time, never happened. So in 2014, what happened was, um, the, the Washington Education Association, along with some other folks, in, uh, put Initiative 1351 on the ballot, which passed, which they basically did, they were tasking the legislature with doing two things. One is reducing class sizes uh, across the board and also increasing the staff, the support staff uh, significantly. It was interesting in that proposal uh, there is no equity component for staff. So again, you know, this the, it was allocated equally to everybody. Although there was an equity component in the class size reduction, they set a, a smaller class size um, for the high poverty schools. And so anyway, that, that passed. The legislature basically, for the most part, ignored it for a number of years. The only thing they did do was they did uh, have smaller class sizes for K-3, and they did for one year have a yet smaller class size for high poverty schools, but then they equalized it again. So um, finally, in, and they didn't address the, the, the support groups at all. So finally, the legislature in 2019 set up the staff enrichment work group uh, to go away and study this issue. And basically they came back and says, well, do what initiative 1351 said you were supposed to do. And um, that went to the legislature. Again, that group had no equity component for the staffing uh, uh, a part of it. Um, and it recommended that Initiative 1351 basically be uh, implemented over three years. The legislature kind of ignored that until we come up to the current year, 2022, where they did implement um, 1664 which uh, starts to fund uh, the staffing uh, groups. And of course, because of the pandemic, they, they started with the nurses, which, um, and so that's, they're gonna be significantly increase the number of nurses, but not really significantly increase the number of social workers, psychologists or counselors. And again, there's no equity component. So it's the same for everybody uh, phased in over three years. Um, but so it's still a long way away from, from ample uh, in any way, even the social workers now go to one to you know, one social worker for five thousand, which isn't going to work either. So um, anyway, it's you know they made they made a step toward it, but we're still a long ways away from it. And in terms of future sessions, you know there still needs to be the focus on getting ample funding, as the Constitution says, and then getting that equity component has been really tough, and we're not going to close gaps without those equity components. So thanks for the opportunity to lay that out. Yeah, and thanks so much for the information, Dave. That was really helpful. Jacob from League of Education Voters. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, um, and I would echo everything Dave just said around um, the, the challenges with actually having equitable funding structures in Washington State. Um, and that's work that will be con Lev will be continuing to engage on um, going forward as well. Um, everyone has shared such great information so far, um, kind of building off what some folks shared around um, the legislation around the compensation for lived experience, which just for folks is 5973 Senate bill. Um, and then it was mentioned by, um, I think Kendrick, Emily and some other folks around there's a, a shift in how the legislature is starting to kind of approach or think about um, these, uh, the value and the knowledge and skills that folks um, with the experience can bring to the table. Um, and I just did a, a quick search on the last two budgets, this current budget cycle and the previous one, and lived experience is included 14 times in this current budget. Um, in the Senate law. And if you go back to when the 
previous two year budget was made initially, that was not included even one time, um, which doesn't mean that we're, we're there, but they're making an acknowledgement that um, it is something that has been missing historically. And they there's an attempt to at least um, start to include it in a um, in small ways um, to hopefully um, get better um, results and get better policy for everyone. So just wanted to mention that quickly. Um, kind of on a similar note um, and um, to some of the, the, the comments that were placed in the chat earlier, one of the bills that didn't quite get through, but hopefully um, we'll get some more attention going forward is H HB 1802. And that's around requiring inclusion of, of individuals with disabilities. Um, uh, and that's the language that was used in the bill um, uh, in um, uh, committees, task forces, work groups that are convened by, by the state. Um, it didn't end up getting through the process. It made it through committee in the House, but didn't actually get to the House. Um, but the fact that uh, they would require um, a, a minimal amount of um, a base amount of representation from students with from individuals with disabilities, I think, um, is something that I don't think you would have seen a few years ago. So I think um, there's obviously still a long way to go. But um, I think there's a, a deeper understanding from legislators on how we need to change. I think you're starting to see the beginning of that, um, this session at least. Um, and one more area um, to, to mention is there was a small budget proviso um, of $3.5 million that was placed in the budget for this upcoming school year um, around multi-tiered systems of support, uh, MTSS, which um, provides uh, social, emotional, behavioral, and academic supports for students, um, either across whole schools or in more targeted ways. Um, and it provides some resources to districts to um, uh, develop and implement um, these approaches uh, and models to better support the mental health and social emotional needs of students, especially as they um, uh, um, uh, re-engage in school and are dealing with the consequences and impacts of the pandemic. Um, uh, so it's, we'll hopefully see more built on that um, as we go forward, but that was, I think, another positive step that was included in the budget um, that will hopefully see dividends and how students are supported going forward. Um, and I, I think that's that's it. Everyone um, covered so much. I don't really have much to say. Well, thank you so much, Jacob. I really appreciate that. And just so you know, I will be sending a link to a budget summary that Jacob put together that will cover what was highlighted in the budget, at least from, from our perspective. I think we got most of what was covered here in that summary. So watch for that in the follow-up email. In the last few minutes that we have, uh, Shreya, I know you had a question for the panel that you'd like to ask. Yeah, so I was wondering, um, all of you come from such diverse backgrounds of different organizations that are supporting youth in different ways. And if you could give some insight on what you would want the student advisory board or just the advisory board in general that is going to be dealing with um, giving mental health days to students and uh, figuring out how more resources can be given to students on those mental health days. Um, if you could just share a bit about what your priorities for that advisory panel would be, advisory board would be. I can, I can start. I think um, for us, when I talk to, to our staff, the, the whole issue of, of getting more counselors, social workers, psychologists available to students and the, in the, in the fact that the state really doesn't fund any of them to, um, amply or even adequately, that would, that would be to get involved. I know sometimes the budget is a kind of intimidating thing to get to jump into, but and how the funding allocation actually works, but I think that, that would be my advice. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you for the question. Um, and I think another one, um, at least for me, is what could schools do more to hopefully support students so they um, maybe need to take fewer days? Um, if they're getting some of the um, better support day to day um, or more holistic support, um, could that um, maybe require the use of these days less from a student perspective? I would say. Uh make sure to push folks for timelines for when they're going to do things. Make sure to uh, be there to hold other folks accountable because it's easy for all of us. I'm going to say all of us, uh, probably everyone on this call, everyone listening, right? We all have a lot of different priorities. 
but this is a priority for people serving on this board. It's a priority to have more mental health care and behavioral health care for students and all Washington citizens. Push for times, push for deadlines, push for action. So don't don't let it uh, just be words. I was gonna. I was so um, surprised and impressed when you were giving the legislative updates and you mentioned the reduced cost of insulin. Because what I thought then was that you are a group of young people who are thinking broadly about well-being of young people in, in our communities. So I would just say, please keep doing that. Um, please keep thinking broadly. You, you might have a specific question you're looking at, but these things are so interrelated. And you know, we've gotten into the habits of doing things a certain way for so long. It's like we are just blind sometimes to something different. So uh, keep that kind of broad and, and creative thinking that you've been doing. Emily, Ben, Kendrick, anything you'd like to add? Um, sort of, and I'm sorry, I think I lost track of who said it. Um, I think it may have been Andy, but sort of going along the theme of, you know, pushing people for plans of actions and when they're going to do things. I think putting things in writing, I think really getting organized. You know, there are a lot of, Washington is a local control state. So there are a lot of things that are hard to change in schools um, through legislative actions. You know, we're constantly told, this is local control, school boards have power of this. Um, and so one of the things that ACLU has on our website is a how to advocate in front of your school board advocacy toolkit that sort of walks you through some of the steps and processes for advocating before the school board and sort of how to get organized and make those movements because your local school boards have a lot more power than you think. Now, obviously they can't make money that does not exist up here out of the ether. You know, so state, the states aren't funding um, providing any funding that's going to go toward mental health services and things like that. They can't make money appear, but there's a lot of money out there that maybe could be re reallocated, right? Like a lot of, a lot of schools have started to step away from their SRO programming, um, therefore saving themselves hundreds of thousands <laughs> of dollars. Um, and that, and the money that are used for those contracts or, or other types of agreements and things that when you really start to dive into, um, Things can be pushed around. Things can be pushed around a bit, but it, it really starts with sort of gathering, gathering voices, um, getting getting these requests in writing, showing up at these meetings, making yourself heard. You know, most of these school boards are elected officials, and if they know that the people who are standing in front of them are going to control <laughs> their future on the board, um, they're more likely they're more likely to be responsive. Um, and students can start this push, and you can start by educating each other. And you can then start by educating your parents and getting them worked up and, you know, really moving in that direction. Not that you need your parents. You guys can do this just as <laughs> you folks can do this just as students. Um, but, there, you know, there's a lot of different strategies you can take. And I think a lot of it really starts with going directly to the source, which is the, the local school board. Mm -hmm. And Shreya, I just want to build on what Kendrick was just saying. Um, my comment to you was going to be to work with local PTA or PTSA groups um, to get parents on your side, because um, as he said, you don't need parents, but it's really nice to have them. Uh, if you don't have to fight two battles at one time, like by getting you know parents to sign on and think that that's a great idea, I think that that's a really um, good way that you can organize those voices and, and build power. Yeah, thank you all for your thoughts. One thing that we really wanted to make sure when we were doing this similar to everything that everyone was saying was it wasn't just another way students could take something off, but it was concrete ways that they're actually bettering their mental health. And so it's really exciting to see a shared vision that's kind of building together. Yeah, thanks so much. And, and in the last minute here, I'd like to give each student the opportunity to add any final words if they'd like based on what they've heard today or just anything they want to add. And uh, Mahad, I'll call on you first, and then uh, we'll go to Israel and, and Shreya if you'd like. So Mahad, um, any final thoughts from you? Okay, it's sweet that I don't have to interrupt Shreya and Israel this time. <laughs> Glad that we adjust that. But all jokes aside, and uh, what I learned this throughout this legislative session is a group of people coming together, and that's what we really need in order to, in order to address issues that, in, that impact our community, the immigrant community. Like, and uh, I'm I'm the newest member of One America. I joined One America this past December, and I got to see how 
how hard and uh, they worked uh, in, uh, to speak up and fight for the human rights of all immigrants in the state of Washington. And the House of 1153 is an example of this. And I just want to thank and, uh, once again, Katie Dong for uh, allowing me to come on her team and, uh, and push for this bill to and, uh, pass. And um, hopefully the governor Inslee will sign this bill. But all I just want to say that is uh, the House of 1153 is one of many examples of how when we come together, we can achieve many great things. You know what I'm saying? Immigrants who come, and I just want, and what I really want to say is when immigrants come to a Western country for the first time, time they, they kind of feel lonely. But when we introduce them and try to help them out, they kind of like boost, their confidence gets boosted. And that's what we really need, helping immigrants in order for them to thrive. And I reached, and I saw, and last night I saw a King County's executive and a Constantine, Dal Constantine, who said King County should be a thriving place where everybody is a, everybody should be welcomed. And he's right. We need to welcome all immigrants in, in the state for, who are coming from Ukraine, Somalia, Yemen, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, Lebanon, Palestine, Latin America, and so much more. And I feel like this country and uh, needs to recognize its role in uh, creating refugees throughout throughout and uh, throughout and its history, and that's unfortunately lacking. And, and so we need to make sure that all immigrants get their rights and get the essential services they need in order to thrive in society. That's all I have to say. Israel, uh, Shreya, take it away, please. And I just want to thank thank the both of them, Israel and Shreya, for their outspoken leadership on, on immigrant issues. And I'm hoping I could work with the, the LYAs, the LEF, I don't know how you pronounce it, but <laughs> I just want to thank them for speaking up on immigrant issues. And with, the, uh, with that, I'm going to pass the baton to Israel and Shreya. Go ahead, guys. I appreciate it, Ken Ward. Um, thank you, everyone, for all your work on this legislative session. I know it can be tiring a lot. A lot. Um, and with the legislation, legislative session coming to an end, um, local school boards aren't done. Um, city council meetings aren't over. Um, your county commissioners or whatever you, whatever county you call it, they're not done. Um, there's so much more work to be done in a local community, in your city, in your county, things like that. Yes, we make amazing change on a statewide level, but I've, if you've heard me speak at webinars before, my strongest belief is that you can make the most change in your local area because they directly serve you. They don't have such a wide population to serve. They have your city, they have your district, things such as that. And encourage everyone watching and listening to reach out to local, local legislators and elected. Tell them the issues that you're seeing. Also, I want to advocate LIAC. So LIAC has applications open. So if you know anyone who's awesome on LIAC, um, have to grades eight through 10, application i will put it in chat um but awesome I send them our way love to have more people always want to create a diverse um council better serve washington that's all we have i'm afraid Um, my computer is slowly dying, so I'm not sure if this is getting to any of you, but uh, I would just want to say that a lot of you are doing amazing change for students, and the only thing I would say is um, talk to students, uh, try to involve them more, because I promise you when you are able to, like when I talk about the work that LIAC is doing to fellow peers, they get really excited and they want to get involved, and they're, how can I testify, how can I do this, and so I promise you if you just keep on reaching out to students, they are invested in changing their education just like you are, and so again, LIAC is just an embodiment of this, and we try to preach it everywhere we go, that um, involving students in the legislature, especially with um, issues such as like education and things that we were talking all talking about 
in this webinar, it's of the utmost importance. And so I would just encourage everyone to reach out to students. And also thank you all for all the work that you're doing. Again, is, as a student, it means a lot that adults care <laughs> this much about our well-being. Well, thank you, Shreya, Israel, Mahad, Emily, Ben, Rose, Kendrick, Andy, Dave, and Jacob. And thanks to all of you for participating and interacting in the chat. Special thanks to our partner organizations, the Washington State Legislative Youth Advisory Council, the One America Youth Council, Open Doors for Multicultural Families, Graduate Tacoma, the Washington State Governor's Office of the Education Ombuds, ACLU Washington, Career Connect Washington, and the Tukwila School Board. I'll include links to their websites in the follow-up email, which you should receive in about 24 hours. Our next webinar is next Thursday, March 24th. We have assembled another statewide panel of Latino students, thought leaders, community leaders, and educators to share their perspectives on how to support Latino and Latinx students during this historic and challenging time. This webinar will be presented in Spanish with live English interpretation and live closed captioning in English available. And it'll be moderated by League of Education Voters Director of Field and Community Engagement, Eric Olsenfeld. The registration link is on our website, educationvoters.org. Just click on events, then lunchtime webinars. And I'll also share the webinar information in the follow-up email, which you should receive in about 24 hours. Thank you to each of you for joining us today. If you have additional questions or comments, please send them to me at eric, A-R-I-K, at educationvoters.org. A recording of today's presentation will be available on our website, educationvoters.org, and will be sent to you in the follow-up email. Please feel free to share this recording with your friends and colleagues. If you'd like to learn more about League of Education Voters or support our work, just go to our website, educationvoters.org. Thank you again for attending. Each one of us has the right to feel safe and valued. Together, we'll fight for a world in which true educational and economic equity exists. We look forward to seeing you at future webinars. Shreya, Israel, Mahad, Emily, Ben, Rose, Kendrick, Andy, Dave, and Jacob, thank you again for joining us and thank you for all you do for Washington students and families. I hope you have a great rest of your week.